Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this morning's EMA Exchange webinar. I hope you're all well. Um, just before we get started with this morning's session, um, a couple of things uh, that I'd like to announce. We are looking to reach out to any furloughed staff, any furloughed in-house corporate event professionals who are looking to join a community of other furloughed people. So we're looking to arrange meetups on Zoom or any of the other platforms um, and uh, look for possible support in terms of helping EMA drive things forward in this challenging time. So if anyone is furloughed um, or has colleagues that are furloughed and um, they're looking for some support um, and a, a network of people to talk to, then please email me, james at ema-uk.com. And also we are, we've put together a working group or a couple of working groups to start building our roadmap to the recovery, um, you know, post COVID. And um, if anyone's interested in joining that, an email's going out tomorrow. So please keep your um, eyes peeled for that. Right, without further ado, I'm going to move on to uh, introducing um, our session for this morning, which is um, getting a venue perspective on what sort of events will look like in a post-COVID world. Um, I'm going to hand over to Richard, our EMA chair, who's going to take things from here. I'm going to keep quiet. Uh, Richard, over to you. Thanks very much, James, and thank you everyone for joining us. And a big, big thank you uh, to my three panellists. Um, who we're going to chat um, because I know there's no hard and fast rules as yet um, and we're all sort of finding our way um, to you know back to some form of norm whatever the norm is um, so it's very much an exploratory discussion about you know how you guys are starting to approach what we're doing um, but of course the big question is is when can we return to live how will it look when will we as people uh, be ready to go back to events um, uh, as attendees, etc. So you know, many, many questions and a massive challenge. You know, COVID nineteen has devastated our industry. It's it's devastated your guys' industry, your venues, your buildings, your um, etc. And um, all the people employed in, 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 across and throughout your business. Um, I read this morning that Hong Kong had done its uh, Con Hong Kong Convention Center. Had, had its first event over the weekend. Hotels are starting to reopen in China, lots of restrictions, slow start, but you know, things are starting to return to some form of a normality. Um, uh, and you know, we will hear this week, I believe, about you know, moving into step two of the phasing, um, which will begin in the 1st of June, which I think is all the schools partially reopening, non-essential retail. Um, I don't think that means pubs, unfortunately, um, but the sort of non-essential retail down the high street, etc., um, will reopen. And then step three is if everything goes well to plan, um, which may happen from 4th of July, we'll see the reopening of, of, some, of some of the hospitality industry and other public spaces um and you know including sort of like the hairdressers which i can't wait to get into um beauty salons pubs hotels and leisure facilities such as cinemas rachel um so before we sort of go into the the, the detail of the conversation like i said i'm going to break the conversation down into three three key areas one around your facilities the other about human inter interaction and thirdly, it's all around sort of contractually. Um, but guys, if, if I can ask you to introduce yourself and just give us a minute on um, how, how it has affected your business and everything, and your, you know, your business, yourself and your, and your colleagues, and then, then we'll start talking about facilities. So, so Rachel, do you, want to, do you want to kick it off? Yes, no, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, View Cinemas, I head up the conference and events area, so I kind of sit between the events industry, I've always had a background in tourism, and now in the media film world with View. So um, I come at from it from the two perspectives today. So um, hopefully with everything going in the right direction, on the 4th of July, we will be able to reopen. Um, but as a business, we had to 
make that decision before we went into lockdown that we made the decision to close all of our cin cinemas. So um, most of you probably know us as a UK brand. We are actually international. So we've got cinemas in Denmark, Germany, Poland. Um, so all of our sites closed globally, um, with the exception of our one in Taiwan, which has been trading right throughout. So as a business, we had to transition closing. It's not a matter of just closing your doors. You've got a lot of aspects that you have to think about um, during the closure. Um, then after we got through the closure, it was then um, a lot of staff had to be furloughed. So we have furloughed at that point 90% of the business, um, which was a very hard decision for the business to make, but it, they fortunately were able to keep a lot of people on board for the first month or so. Um, then we went into the next phase, which was then um, now we're going into the regearing of building up and have brought um, more staff back on board to get ourselves ready to reopen. Um, and that's where we're at at the moment. Thanks. Uh, Janet, give us a... Hello, good morning. My name is Janet Brimfield from the Corinthia Hotel. I'm Group Director for Sales and Marketing, along with my colleague Harry, who's also on the line. Um, we, the majority of our hotels, apart from Budapest, have stayed open the whole time. Um, obviously, our London hotel is closed and we're currently working on an eight-week plan to reopen and obviously working with, with government guidelines and every country has different guidelines so we are going by their guidelines and we're currently awaiting opening dates um, and preparing really because events are going to look completely different so we have to look at our business models and our capacities and everything and work out exactly how it's going to be but every country is totally different so we're just working towards it and making a plan at the moment. So there's no definite plan as, as yet, but we're just currently working. Harry, do you want to expand on that at all? Uh, no, I think you've covered it fairly well. I mean, it's been a, an extremely challenging period. Um, when we first looked at this at the early part of January about what was going on, that was being headed up by our, our Asian team. I don't think we really, like most of the world, knew what the impact coming down the line would be six to eight weeks later coming into Europe uh, in terms of what that's done. As Janet has said, we've had 90% of our estate closed for the last 10 weeks. Um, but we are now in a position and we have been after we got through the initial challenge of cancelling, postponing, moving events, what do they look like, rebooking um, of into a phase of reopening and what does that reopening look like? And that varies dramatically country by country break even points um so that's where we are at as of the moment uh updating our, our sops internally our position externally and uh what the remainder of 2020 looks like and what 2021 looks like okay cool thanks so much carrie if i just remind you to hold your microphone off and we're getting, we're getting a sort of a little in and out speech sorry about that um, right sorry thanks no problem so let, let's let's think about or talk about space i mean that's the big question is you know we like we, james said earlier we set up a working group within ema to develop some sort of best guidelines and thoughts and questions to ask etc to venues and suppliers as we start to look at coming back in because then we all expect you know to start thinking now and planning and we do know that there is some planning going on for some events for sort of third quarter um, to go to live. Um, uh, we, we expect, we discuss as members of EMA that it will be very local. So returning to business, we'll start off with, you know, the UK doing events, businesses in the UK, um, not necessarily looking to take things overseas initially, and then we'll venture into Europe and, you know, it'll start to sort of, spread out um so everything being local um without sort of major international travel to begin with um but i think the key questions are the key questions we're asking is well you know how can we use a venue what are the restrictions going to be we don't know but now, you know if you talk about a two meter restriction how many people are you thinking about you can get into a room how are you going to how are you going to manage uh that 
um, around, you know, from a meeting point of view, for networking, for dinners, room layouts, etc. You know, what sort of thoughts have you given given to that? I'm gonna I'm gonna come to um, Janet and Carey first because they're more complex um, with their space, and then um, then we'll, we'll we'll have a chat with Rachel. So, guys, you want to kick that off? What, what have you been thinking about? Well, from our perspective, we are reviewing, as, as Janet said, with every government and every local authority, what that looks like. And that is changing drastically. Um, the two metre ruling, as you know, is, is, is being set by the UK government at the moment. And with the scientific information, I think it was quite interesting yesterday on PM's question time with regards to him questioning that and what that looks like. And that doesn't just affect our meeting facilities and our capacity. It affects our restaurants, it affects our, uh, our dining areas in London where we do afternoon teas. What does that look like? So at the moment, the complexity of that is as challenging as, as anything we're trying to do. Any of the health and safety measures that we're putting in place on top of what we had as a luxury brand, um, we would expect, and that's a, a, a minimum expectation from a luxury brand. So I think it's more about how and what is set out in the coming weeks with regards to what we can do. The interesting point is a number of events that have rebooked for the latter part, and as you said, Q3 and Q4 of 2020 have been booked as per cancelled. Mm -hmm. So we're now having to work with these clients to say, well, what does it, what does your event look like? And we know that the domestic travel is going to be the first point of travel back. But for us, the majority of our travel is international travel. So it's people coming in internationally to our locations for events that have been held, whether they be uh, corporate events, um, sales events, external events. The majority of them are international events. So I think um, we continue to work and be advised on government, and then we will come back and see what the need and the appetite is for that. And also, I think that I don't think it will just be the venues and the hotels around that. It seems that from the conversations that we've had with our corporate clients, they're trying to understand what that looks like as well. Will the initial bit be a blend of hybrid and live events? Are people going to go back to live events? What is the touch and what are the touch points pre, pre event or pre arrival? What's going to be on site available um, for isolation or what is that going to look like? And at the moment, as, as rebuilding a reopening plan, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've opened hotels, new hotels in the last 10 years. I, this is Carrie, gonna, gonna, Carrie, so I'm going to have to jump in there. Your, your sound is really, really bad. Um, James, I'm going to ask Kerry to log out and log back in again, see if that helps, helps again, because your, you know, your, your sound is really terrible. Right, okay. Right, but if you log out and then James will let you back in, come back in through the same link. Um, right, okay. I'll carry on um our conversation our conversation as we wait for you thank but thanks for that and i think it is really challenging working out what is it going to look like and how it's going to feel um so janet just to finish on that on what i caught there from kerry is like the stuff that you had people had had postponed or cancelled and postponed yeah. the last, that's now cancel all cancelling off yeah well the stuff for still we still have a lot pending for october for uh, which and we're speaking to them obviously about is their event going to fit in the space that they had booked because some of them were to maximum capacity. So we need to relook at that. There's always, always options that will they make their event over two weeks instead of over one week so that majority of people can attend, but just attend at different times so that there's less people for the event. So it's just working with all the clients and making sure that their event is going to be as successful as they planned. And obviously the hotel needs to, back themselves up as well. So we need to make sure the contracts are obviously going to change and everything like that. So that's going to be a big thing. Um, so really it's just a working progress, Richard, at the moment. And we're working with every client we can there. But we do have bookings yet for quarter four. So with regards to 2021, we still have very few inquiries coming in, but they are coming in. I'm seeing quite a lot for 22. So I think people are definitely booking for too, but that's too oh, fast. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Short lead time. I'm like, oh my goodness. A few years ago, they never would have got an inquiry for like for two years' time. Impossible. 
So it's just really a work in progress that we're going. We just we don't know enough about the the virus as well, and you know, and what way we can move forward because it's still a learning progress for everybody. Okay. So, so we don't know what. Else, sorry. No, no, okay. So, Rachel, so from your, from your point, I mean, I think what's interesting, the first question to you would be, how big is, or how big was the meetings and events industry sector to, to VU? And, um, yeah, yeah, how, how you're then looking to, to bring that back. Yeah. Um, it is a, a substantial part of our business. So, <clears throat> we have a team of seven that run our conference and event side of it. So, that covers from private screenings to school bookings through to um, your corporate conferencing events. Um, so, we've really, with what we're doing as a business, is we're looking at our protocols and we're knowing that we've got government guidelines um, for different countries. But at the same time, we're saying, what is our desired outcome because for us it's key about um, safety of our clients and giving them reassurance and confidence when they come back and that they want to come back um, and also our, looking after our staff in that process so we're fortunate that we have been able to with having lots of different screens in each location we're eight and different size capacities we've been able to flex that and we've reduced that down that you actually can accommodate social distancing within a screen um, based up to two meters. Um, some countries are down to one meter already and some are talking about 0.5. So we've actually done the scenarios based on all of those distances. Um, obviously, when it comes to the conference bookings that we've got that are forward booked, like Janet was saying, um, it's about flexing that. We're fortunate that we can actually move the screens around. So if you've got a booking for 100 people, we can move you onto a larger screen that will then still accommodate that if we're allowed to have events for that number. Um, but a big part of our business now moving forward that we're seeing is really the hybrid events. Um, we have had events that have used streaming previously, where they're delivering a message out to a wider part of the business. And um, what they've then done is had different locations where they delivered that message from one hub to maybe 25 cinemas um, around the UK or around um, the world. So what we're now seeing is a lot more of those inquiries coming through where They'll have maybe the board or the committee at one location and then they'll be delivering that out. So some of the ones that we've seen is where previously for 1,700 people um, is now open that into a regional event and they've got 50 people going to different locations that's delivering that one message to all of those people. Um, it's the safety that we've then got to make sure and we're looking at that with the flows within to the site of the um, safety, safeguarding. So we've got what we're going to designate as safeguarding staff. So we'll have people designated in foyers and screens um, for the conference organizers for those events. Okay, so there's training and everything for those people. Um, yeah. One thought that, just, that came to me, because I think this, you know, the two meter, um, and I guess this is just me thinking, the two meter rule is, is it going to make it impossible to run, you know, a proper event? And that's definitely something that we as EMA are going to be talking and discussing impossible. And, you know, whether if the government, when, when we get round to this, this next level of release, that they are able to then at that point reduce it to a metre, which I think is then possible and plausible to, to, to run something, but standing six feet away from anybody else or other people is is nigh on impossible and i know they you know sort of catering hospital i've got friends that have got yeah. restaurants you know i can't you know I'm, my friend of mine is a chef there's no point at all in me opening my restaurant with a with a two meter rule it would be impossible um and i think we also feel from an events interaction point that that kind of makes an event impossible your guys you, is that sort of discussion that's going on at your places or yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the biggest challenge that the, the in-screen side of it is quite straightforward for us because we've mapped out all of each sites now based on a two-meter 
um, with a 25% occupancy down and then increasing that up. Um, I think the challenges that um, we're facing at the moment is those events that are already being postponed or booked for later in the year is what will those spaces look like for them. At the biggest um, hurdle that we're working to overcome at the moment is about the catering spaces and what that will look like and how we'll cater for them because I think that will definitely change. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, yeah. do you want to add anything there? Yeah, we're, we have quite large spaces, so for the likes of Lisbon we can see 800 people so we're looking at what way we can do that. So thank goodness we have large meeting spaces that we can accommodate and we're looking now at capacity charts and how they can reduce them and what it, what each um, government guidelines on numbers. So really we're just, it's all a work in progress really. So no definite plans. Yeah, one of the things that we came up in a, with a discussion, uh, EMA discussion like the other week was like, you know, how you manage that with people in especially networking or an exhibition space and you know sort of the tea coffee break and we even talked about something like gridding the floor with sticky tape it sounds awful yeah. with your beautiful carpets i know i know <laughs> but at least and, people know yeah. oh, that's smart you know it's a bit like the parks in new york where you see the white the, you know the white circle yeah. and everyone sort of sits in their little pods but i think those are those are the hardships that we're going to have to look at, at how yeah, and catering as well Catering yeah. for high numbers, yeah. Yeah, we're going to come on to the catering in the human interaction. I think there's, there's two points um, further on the sort of facilities management from mine. Um, and cleaning is a big topic. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think we need to talk about front of house cleaning and stuff like that because you guys, um, especially, I'm sorry, but I'll talk with Corinthia because, you know, five star deluxe properties, you're, you're cleaning everything is spotless. Um, I know you, of course, Vu Hotels, Vu, Vu, sorry, cinemas are also spotless as we visit them regularly. Um, but one of the other areas of that is all the third party equipment and stuff that's coming in on site. Now, that perhaps links into contractual obligations, but I think you guys also need to be thinking about saying, okay, your third party contractors, if they're coming on site, if they're yours, that you've got policy SOPs with them. To make sure that all equipment has been cleaned before it comes mm -hmm. in all their staff have been checked and cleaned well you know not cleaned but you know that we know that they've been tested or something um or if they're coming in through your clients you need to perhaps be asking that question with the client to make sure they have um you know as operation standard operation procedure for those third, third party suppliers bringing kit in so you know making sure that it's been you know, clean down before it comes on site or it will be cleaned down on site by the delivery people. I, you know, because that again is another product coming into your properties that doesn't necessarily have your responsibility. It could be third party. And then there is that question about your staff, your back of your back off staff, that how you're managing that and help checking on their health or do, doing temperature checks on people when they arrive on site. It's part of that thing coming into the building. So I'm talking about back office staff, third party suppliers. Have you started to think through that yet? Richard, can you hear? Am I, am I clearer now? Welcome. <laughs> yes, we got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, from, from our perspective, our, our, our revised SOPs are probably uh, a third of the size uh, front of house than they are back of house. So what we're looking at in terms of there is 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 our contractors and any contractors that are linked through a client that's linked to a contract will have to meet our standards, whether they're coming in, whether that's our contractors or an external contractor. Now that can be bringing equipment back through the loading bay and, and the cleansing and sanitation process that's going to, uh, sanitizing process that's going to take place. But that will be our initial position on that and how that looks and what type of equipment um, will be done and who will be handling that. And that comes from external team members as well as our own team as well. So we very much thought about that because of the amount of, as Janet mentioned, the amount of events that we have where we have sets built, we have staging, we have um, outsourced suppliers, and we're going to need to ensure that we have who they are. And, and I'm, I'm not talking on behalf of the company now that linked to the tracing 
um, system that's happening in the UK. I can very much see that happening in terms of who's coming into back of house that will be registered so that we can track and trace that as well. That's not been confirmed as yet because obviously that's only a development that's here uh, at the moment. But to your point about the two meter ruling as well, that would have a, that if that continues and it hasn't across Europe, luckily at such a level as the UK, it would have a huge impact in terms of just the commercial viability of, of the events that are held at our, some of our hotels. Yeah. And I, I, I sit on the board of the BBEP um, and I know that we have, we have put it through the DCMS representative on that board that, you know, that needs to be reduced to a minimum of one metre uh, before you can even consider live events yep. being a practical, feasible um, return. So we know that the DCMS are sort of nodding in agreement, they hear us, and they're feeding that back into government. So hopefully before the 4th of July, we will, we will hear something along those lines. Um, it's interesting that they can't they can't two meter distance in a school. So how are they going to two meter distance in an event? So you're not going to put two, a child two meters away. So yeah, we know these these executives that come to these uh, events are bigger children than the ones at schools. <laughs> um, technology. So the you know you, you touched earlier about the hybrid event um, mm -hmm. and you know the return of those. That you know, we will not return to events as events were in the past. There's absolutely, in my mind, and with lots of the people who are corporates that we talk to, anybody else, you know, the hybrid event is here for the future. And you know, we kind of, in our discussions, have flipped the whole sort of thinking of how events will be and events for, for the next foreseeable future, and I mean sort of the next 12, 18 months, until we know that there's a vaccine and everything else, events will be led by technology. It will be, we will be planning an event which is driven by technology and online, which will then be supported by live when the live can be introduced. So it might be that, you know, you have an event on that has got keynote speakers, um, which could be being beam, beamed in, Scotty, or um, or whatever, and at your facility. But let's say there's 50, 100 people at your facility, there could be a four or 500 people elsewhere in the world watching that. So the technology um, and the, you know, the bandwidth, everything else is, is key for the success of those. I'm presuming VU has, does that regularly, because I know you yeah. see major concerts and stuff like that. So. You're yeah. in a very good, part, very good place with the techno technological support that you guys have got in house already. Yes. Yeah, we've, we're very fortunate that we've been doing this for a few years now with um, event cinema. So you'll have big events where they're broadcasted into um, each cinema through satellite and people watch the show. Likewise, from the conferencing side of it, we mirror that. So um, we have events where they will either satellite in and um, have a broadcasting um, truck outside one of the sites where they'll be delivering the presentations, the speakers, and then that will be then transmitted to our sites around the UK. Um, or alternatively, what we see more and more of is it's maybe a basically a state of the nation and update from a business because I think we're all seeing in these times that we're working very remotely but people are wanting to kind of connect with each other um, so it's a, a good situation where we can deliver these hybrid events where you can have the board of directors maybe and uh, sitting at one of our sites social distance and delivering their messages to the wider business that can be done through either having a small number of people at the sites um, as well as then that can be then transmitted to individuals that maybe don't feel as comfortable about traveling to locations because that's going to build up over time there's going to be people that are want to socialize here and now and then you've got people that are reluctant to and then you've got those that are vulnerable that can't so 
the this hybrid system works very well for us and, and it's tried and true that we've had it delivered and we've got inquiries already coming in for new events from October onwards for clients that we're going to have to do those large events, re-looking really at how they structure them um, through into next year. Rachel, just to follow up on that, is that um, from a technology point of view, mm -hmm. uh, do you guys just take a fee from whoever's producing the event um, to beam across three or four of your venues, or are you involved in the production side of the um, ultimate event that you're recording that's been pr produced? Yeah, we have um, AV providers that we work with who deliver those events because they've got the expertise to know how to connect to our in-screen projectors and then deliver that technology out. I'm not thinking in, inside. So like, let's say you take something live from the Royal, Royal Philharmonic and you yeah. that's then broadcast across your cinemas. Mm -hmm. Are you doing the any work with the Royal Philharmonic at the, at the, the concert hall or are you just taking a fee from there? The, no, we just actually are the host venue. So we act as the venue for it. So the Philharmonic will manage the broadcasting. They will then, um, we then just have to pay for the satellite connection. Okay. And then we have the, the guests. So in those situations, it's the people that attend that pay. And that's where we earn our um, revenue from it. From okay. a content okay. printing side of it, it's a slightly different setup. All right, but then the other side of that, that if someone was to use one of your theatres as the main hub, so if we look mm -hmm. at you, you've heard the, the hub and spoke, use your one of your main theatres as the main hub, that can then, via your stuff, be broadcast out to four or five other cinemas through your systems. Yes, yeah. Or an example we did um, last year was an event that required... Uh, about 50 different locations they had about five and a half thousand people they had to transmit to their hub location was um, a central London big venue that then they had their broadcasting facilities in-house and yeah. then we were one of the transmission locations where delegates attended okay so over to, over to the hotels then is you know the technology side presumably you, you know your up to speed on this, you're going to have to upgrade or, or what? There's a mixture of both. I think there's a mixture of both. We've got the capability to do that. Obviously, we don't know what the new norm is going to look like in terms of that. So uh, from that, obviously, it's a completely different position for us. We've always been able to support the uh, level of technology required in the past, what the new norm looks like. And also, you know, we've, we've always tried, you know, technology has been around. We've talked about different forms of video conferencing video you know connections zooms we've been trying to get people to meet face to face in our properties so we're now having to look at our our sales and uh, our sales process around that and what that will look like and again our our av teams on site will become as important in the pricing uh process of that and working with our clients and our third parties in doing that but luckily, we, we have the capability. Do we think we'll need to look at infrastructure? I think there'll be a question of how long the infrastructure looks like and how far that goes compared to what we expect this to look like. If this is, you know, two to three years, then there will, we will, I, I'm assuming we will continue to look. But we, I think we've looked and we've, luckily we've been in a position of developing our technology over the last uh two or three years as technologies develop so we we're in a good position to support those new hybrid events as well as the larger events that we are still seeing coming in um for the back end of predominantly the larger events are coming in for 21 and 22 but those events that we had on the books that were for the early part of 2020 that have rescheduled for 2020 we don't know what they're going to look like and how they're going to materialize at the moment. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So let's, let's move on to the sort of next category of our sort of the human interaction. So we've got this event, it's happening, it's live. Yes. We're going to have, you know, broadcast out of your facilities and everything else. Um, but you know, I, I arrive at your property. Am I going to be met to greet? I mean, we don't know the answers, but you know, people in PPE equipment and, sanitizers and gels and this that the other isolate you know, 
how do we manage the human interaction um, with with people on on site, um, and how do we feel that's going to work? Tea, coffee service, food service, hygiene, etc. What sort of you know? We've had a lot of work that's gone on because obviously we've got sites that have started to reopen um, over in Europe. Um, so we kind of have taken some of the best practice plus also the learnings from them. Um, but a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last few weeks from the um, cinema environment is the best flow. So we are fortunate enough that we can, um, at some of our locations, we can do a one directional flow that people come in. They're met by what we all have as our safeguarding um, hospitality staff member who will then guide them through to their screen. Um, it's from the customer experience, it will be all contactless so then they can just transition their way through into the screen. Um, there will be someone then in screen to make sure to support that social distancing um, and then exiting from there. Um, the catering side of it, what we're seeing at the moment is people are really not wanting much on the catering front. Um, we're having to look at the tea and coffee service side of it, but what we're seeing, the requests that we're getting at the moment are more for like sandwich lunches, salad boxes, something that an individual can take. Yeah, it's interesting with the pre-packaged food, anything sort of like the, you know, the um, was it bento box or something like that? It's yeah. Fine, you get given it to it's still being handled by somebody. It's still, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, um, and, and that's what we're asking all our suppliers. Um, currently, we're asking them to provide um, what their policies are. Also, then the staff will be in PPE. We're bringing back um, some of the old box office systems, and then we're having to screen off retail areas for people as they arrive and direct people. Yeah, I think it's sort of more airline food for the, for the short period until things sort of um, be, become more comfortable. Again, what about you You guys on the hotel front with this? Sort of the, how do you see it? I mean, it must be very hard to start to think about restrictions and flow of people or, you know, reception staff, door staff, you know, in, in masks. Or is it just well, exactly. And it's like, do you find star hotels? Hotels, you know, wear PPE. That's the thing. It's like London Corinthia, where we have the hostesses in PPE. I think we're all going to have each venue is going to have a sanitation program, which we're currently working on. What will, will there be temperature checks? Will there be with regard to buffets? I think the days of buffets are pretty much gone, really, at the moment for the next foreseeable future. In everything's going to have to be individually packed, but it's just yeah. I think we're just working through and working through each company guidelines as well. I mean, there's the whole thing about the, you know, you have the event, you have cheese and coffees, yes, you have lunch or, you know, that sort of stuff. But then at the end of the, the, the one of the big main reasons for coming to an event, a live event, is, of course, the networking. And, you know, there's that networking during teas and coffees and lunch and everything. Well, that's why the buffet works so well. But the glass of champagne um, and the canopies afterwards. How are we going to get around that? The honest yeah. answer we don't know at the moment yeah. <laughs> I, I, look, I think certainly in the luxury space as, as janet alluded to you know there is a there is a, a premium price paid and there is an expectation that your experience is from the moment you arrive to the moment you leave and all of the elements that you've said are absolutely critical to a live event or the experience at one of our properties it could be potentially very challenging to do that in the current conditions. How long will that last? We don't know. Um, do, do we expect to get back to some form of norm? Absolutely. If for live events to happen and for, for events to continue or, and that's maybe whether it's meetings, conference board meetings, dinners, you know, we, we, we operate across all spectrums of that. So the challenge is, as you say, the not knowing is not allowing us to make decisions in terms of what we do in terms of the reopening plans at the moment yeah but they are being worked on behind and there's some there's some some of our teams divisions that are working extensively with government with local um hospitality divisions to to ensure that we have as much information and guidelines to help us make these decisions 
Yeah, I think we can also sort of, you know, the the attendees and anybody else who listens to this afterwards can be assured that um, you know you guys will be working to find creative and yes. solutions um, that will give experience. Whilst the experience may well be different, um, you know there will be an experience whether it's you know. I'm very happy. You know, we go to the bar to get a drink, so I'm happy to go to a food station to pick up a drink. I don't need it brought to me. You know, people walking around serving drinks. Yes, it's great, but perhaps those ha things have to change for a short period. I remember years ago going to a wonderful restaurant in Tokyo, so I'm going to digress a bit, called The Market, and it's a very traditional, and the chef kneels up on his thing and he, he gets food on like a big pizza server, but he He's um, having it cooked, produced behind him by other people, and then he hands it to people. It's part of the thing because in between him and the people is a whole market stall of fresh food and meat that you can choose from. So again, food being handed to somebody on a tennis racket, not a tennis racket, but something like that, is perfectly acceptable. You know, but we just need to develop those things um, to see how that how those would come across. Okay. Um, Final area, and then we'll, I'll quickly look at some of the questions to see if there's anything there to pick up on. Um, and uh, is, okay, contractually. So cost, contractual, cancellations, another spike, another mutation, uh, which, you know, there has been talk about that, creating a lockdown. Uh, God forbid, you know, the track and trace you mentioned earlier, Kerry, that this, you know, it shows then that all of a sudden that something has happened. It comes back to an event previous week at your property. Um, is that going to close the property down uh, for that period? Or does it, you know, how does that going to react? So what are your thinking? Is the co People are asking, are costs going to go up because of the situations? Do we know that yet? Um, who's going to bear the additional costs? Um, so first, cost pricing points. Been any thoughts and discussions around that internally yet? We've had a lot of discussion around it. Nothing necessarily concrete from it because I think there's the two sides of it. You've got your pricing and you've got your contracting side of it. I've actually got a call later today with our legal team on the contractual side and that's very much the legal speak and that side of it. But I think a big part of it, like we did when we all went into this when we start closing down the sites was actually it's just about being engaging with clients having that relationship um, because at the same time there's a cost to us losing that business but also we want them for the longer term so it, it's very much about that dialogue finding a happy compromise that we can all work through and a lot of that was around a lot of our events that we had to move in March and April all transferred to the back end of this year. Now, some of those are probably looking like that they're going to have to move for their own reassurances. So it's been accommodating to that. Pricing wise for the new events, um, that is challenging because those spaces command quite a high value um, and how you price that because also there's a lot of additional cost in the sense of additional staffing, um, all the PPE, all the safety, the cleaning, um, so, but those are costs that we're generally looking to absorb and just having to work a solution because at the same time, the clients we're wanting back, we have to give them that confidence to come back. Yeah, so we're actually, you know, heads on pillows, bums on seats, price, you know, yeah. people, corporates will see that, you know, virtual stuff is working. Um, do they spend more budget? Their businesses have been hit as well. Um, you know, global economy has been hit enormously, so we all know one of the first budgets to go is the marketing budget. Um, but yeah, so cost. So, Kerry, Janet, any thoughts? You discuss, do you get a feel? I mean, again, this is actually the gut feel if you think prices, are, who's going to bear these costs? Think? I think uh, to Rachel's point, I think that's exactly where we are. I think there'll be a combination of both. I think there'll be an expectation. There, there will always be a uh, coming out of this, a health and safety element of that and enhance health and safety developments. 
in doing so. And then clients will also want the flexibility of that. And in doing so, our job is to try and find the right balance between able to offer the flexibility of that. We've spoke at length with our legal division in London about what that looks like, about having flexible clauses that we can put in specifically for specific events or that we allow our hotels as part of the negotiation process to talk to clients about what they're, what they're going through, how our standard contracts look like, what do addendums look like, because we fully expect as we go through that there's going to be revised addendums coming through and how they fit in with our, with our contracts and our contract templates. But I do believe that there will be a blend between both. As Rachel said, we've had a number of events that have been pushed to the back end of uh, Q3, Q4, Q1. And now we've got people inquiring about those, those dates as well. So there becomes what you would have as your premium dates in terms of our premium meeting dates, that those dates still don't seem to have changed. They still seem to be the key dates that are the key travel dates. So do I believe there'll be a premium on those dates? Potentially, yes. Um, but I think that we will be looking to support as much as possible and look at flexibility and, and, and favourable pricing um, for both elements, us and the client and the end user. Yeah, at the end of the day, it is a supply and demand. And I'm totally appreciative. You know, I've, I've sat both sides of the fence in this industry. Um, and from a property's point of view, you know, if demand is high, you need to make hay while the sun shines. If demands are low, you'd rather have 50 pence in the pound than nothing in the pound, etc. Um, so, you know, supply and demand um, on this. Well, the one thing I do think that we have seen is that there, that we've seen in our segment is that there won't be a sort of fire sale of rate because it's, this is, I don't think this is going to be a rate issue. This will be a demand and confidence issue coming back to the market. So yeah. I think there's an expectation that, you know, you're not going to go out and see price dumps. Um, and we are talking to our, our competitors and our partners around that as well, because it has to be a sense to be able to deliver the absolute quality on top of the quality that we were delivering before. It does come at a cost and we're aware of that. And I think our customer base or an expectation of if you're looking to put an event into a, into a premium brand will have a, cost a, a fair cost associated to it uh on the on the contractual side and um you know what are your views and thoughts on that of sort of terms that um are people asking for or will be looking for i know that we it's something that we are going to be looking into um from an ema point of view and sharing some sort of thoughts and guidelines on you know best practice riders etc um i think there's you know a number of a number of corporates have said wonderful things about the majority of the supply chain market. Um, however, that some people within the supply chain have, you know, have said turn around and say, well, you know, if you can't hold your event, you know, there, there is no cancellation. We want hundred percent of our money up front and, and this, that, the other, and, you know, so thoughts and views on contracts and working together on those and making them fair and acceptable i mean i think here is that you know if there is a lockdown you know i you know if that highs rises again then it's acceptable that an event cannot be held can be cancelled so so i like when you know when people are calling on the pandemic clause which is in lots of contracts then people say yes but covid19 wasn't quoted well we didn't know about covid19 <laughs> um when when that contract when when that contract was signed or that insurance was taken out, um, so those sort of things and cancellation, postponement. A lot of people have pushed for postponement and not cancellation. It's all going to be reviewed on a client basis and just work with the client because we need to protect ourselves and obviously the clients don't want to pay for an event that actually didn't happen. So I think it's just working and getting a happy medium and there has to be a solution for each each client. And when I have my call with our legal team later on, I think we've got, we've got clients that are asking for those terms because it then gives everyone transparency so they know where they stand. But for me, it's very much how do we make this 
almost the human situation of it in the sense of the legal can get very entailed in it and very complicated whereas actually we want something that is still workable and manageable at, because at the end of the day we want to keep our industry alive um, but you've still got to have contracts. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think one of the hardest things I've heard is when people are trying to say so because you know if you cancel your event two weeks before the event where well, there's a 100% cancellation fee um, that to me is totally wrong because that is you're profiteering from the cancellation especially taking food and beverage and everything else into house because the stuff in there that are consumables that have not been consumed i love well, the wine is still sitting in the cellar and that's where you then sort of okay right let's work together to mitigate the costs we, won't, we don't expect you to lose your profit but we don't expect you to profit from a from a cancellation i think those sort of discussions that should be had and generally are had with quality venues and everything else but some of the smaller suppliers in the marketplace have gone to look for the 100 percent cancellations um okay so let's just quickly there's a few questions in the question box uh, just have a look at those see what we've missed anything uh, that's interesting someone's read in the times this morning I'd like to see what people reading the times um uh i rely on the sun and the daily mail usually but the Two metre, one metre rule. That's great to hear. Um, so hopefully, perhaps the word is getting through. We could if it was mm -hmm. the VBE. Corinthia, you've got something there from uh, Elizabeth asking about the cocktail parties network. So I think we've answered that saying you're looking at it. You will yeah. have solutions. You will have ideas. Yeah. Around that. Yeah. We will. I, I mean, before we reopen London, we will have a clear set of guidelines around that that we will communicate. And we're working now on our communication plan around there'll be an individual communication plan for each hotel. And then there'll be a brand communication plan as well. And we'll be able to drill down and look at what a client's requirements are and how we can facilitate that and what the flexibility and creativity around that particular element of the event will be. But I can I can I mean. We can be pretty creative when we want to be within guidelines. There's, there's a great question, comment here uh, from Kate, as a matter of fact, uh, which is a nice one because it reverses the, quite, reverses the conversation. Um, is, you know, it's great to hear from, from you guys what you're doing, else, but also what are you expecting from corporates and organisers? So, you know, your, the interaction the other way is, you know, what do you, what do you want to be hearing from the corporates or the inquiries, I'm going to guess, presumably it's like flexibility, openness, understanding. Yeah, transparency. But also I think support is going to be key because we see it in our day-to-day -day lives. You go for a walk in the park, some people are respecting social distancing, some aren't. So um, that's why we have got this allocation of safeguarding staff to help gently coerce people into actually adhering to those. Um, because I think the one thing that we, is absolutely key is none of us want to see this lockdown situation again. We want to move in a positive direction through this process. So it's really probably from our side is asking corporates to work with us, with our safeguarding staff for their events to ensure that people are adhering to that and working with those flows. Okay. Gary, I, 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 you know, I've, I've spoke to a number of our corporate partners and I've been, you know, on the whole impressed with their partnership, their, their questioning around what are we doing, what can they be doing. And obviously our bit is transparency and partnership. And in terms of we're, we're, we're hoping that once certain restrictions are lifted, that, that, that the corporates will, will travel and will entrust that we will, their, their travellers will be safe when visiting one of our hotels and we just hope that they they continue and they start to to travel sooner rather than later which seems to be in some industries there's there is an appetite of that and you know we're now starting getting no questions when is reopening you know we're keen to get this moving now and i think that will be that's that's hugely important to us because that, because to get out to get our hotels across there operating at their full levels considering when you've fallen off a you know a 90 percent occupancy cliff edge yeah. to to what expectations could be for july it, you know we need to ensure that we want to maintain standards and in doing so we need to get people back through the door with confidence yeah 
Yeah, no, I get, I get that. And it must be uh, so difficult. I mean, you know, I started my training in life at a hotel. I just know how you know, a hotel runs and operates and having let all those staff or furloughed, presumably. Yeah. I thought I thought it was I thought, it, I thought it was difficult seeing the hotels close. The complexity of reopening a hotel in this environment is probably something that we we hope that we we never have to experience again because it's a it's a complex complex operation commercially and um, yeah, from from yeah. a commercial perspective, it's a challenge. It's a big sort of gearing up again, isn't it? The yeah. whole training process. Yeah. Get everybody there ready, but you you know it's trying to bring those two things together at the same time that you've got demand and of you're course. ready for that demand. Otherwise, you're going to have your everyone standing around waiting, costing money or yeah, you know, high demand right. or service. Mm. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think that's a good one. And I think from from that, uh, from what Kate has said there, also to what Gear is saying about the contractual stuff, it's interesting because, like I said, we at EMA are working on developing some documents for best practice. And um, I'm sure a couple of guys are working on that within EMA. I think what we'll do with that before we talk, push it out to our membership is perhaps bring together a separate group, such as yourselves and a couple of other people from the industry. Look, this is what we're gonna suggest to our members and talk it through with you guys. So I think if we can bring the two sides of the industry together and say, look, this is what we think are best practice, best guidelines from an EMA's point of view into our corporate members when they're looking at stuff. You know, it's only guidelines, so it's up to them to then develop their own stuff to go to uh, properties with, but also to, to discuss that, um, uh, to, to discuss that with venues. Say, look, this is what we're thinking. For, and again, for you to talk, okay, yeah, no, we think that's fair. Oh yeah, but that's, you know, you've got to understand our side of that will be the consequences of these things. So. Um, that's just a thought for me um, mm -hmm. to take to take the panel, guys. If you've got, we've got one minute. I don't, have you got any questions or anything you want to say to the the <laughs> audience? We've got about forty people still left on the call, and if not, no, I think one of the things that we're looking at is 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 the wider industry and industry bodies like yourselves is also accreditation is to give yourselves as corporates that in confidence that there are going to be looking at some accreditations and processes in place and accommodate that. So um, that's one of the areas that I think is also key is, is just giving everyone confidence to get back to having events again. Yeah, I would echo those and just say that we are, <laughs> that clients can be rest assured that we are trying to, and we are looking at every avenue in terms of mm -hmm. ensuring safety, security, uh, and also, a great experience because a lot of it is around you know a, a lot of what we do in our industry does have a fun element to it and a, and a, an experiential element to that you know events from right the way across what we across different market segments so we need to introduce that as well so confidence and confidence in in the industry in terms of traveling is key to us getting all moving and that's uh, but thank you for taking the time and setting this up, Richard and James. It's much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. We look forward to welcoming you all again shortly, I hope. Okay, guys. Thank you again. Thank you very much for the conversation. Really appreciate it. Your time, your input, your thoughts. I hope everyone out there has enjoyed that. Uh, James, back over to you to close. Thanks, Richard. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I just want to say quickly a huge thank you to... Uh, the EMA's commercial partners, uh, which are Corinthia Hotels, we've had on the call today, uh, C-Vent, International Conflicts, the meeting show, Business Events Canada and GES. Um, thank you for joining us this morning, everybody. Um, as I said, if, if anyone is furloughed or has colleagues or friends that are furloughed and they're in-house corporate event professionals, we want to hear from them. Um, we want to run a meetup um, online for furloughed people um just as a, a place to chat with like-minded individuals um and vent um share your experience that sort of thing um and also we're reaching out to anyone who's furloughed if they want to help volunteer with the ema and just keeping things moving along keeping our progression going as we, we're growing in terms of member numbers um day by day at the moment 
which is great. Uh, and we, I'm just looking for some support. Or we're looking for some support. And as I said at the beginning, we'll be releasing an email tomorrow that talks about the working group uh, where we're putting together these guidelines that we've been talking about for uh, looking at the road to recovery um, from a corporate perspective. That is it from us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all. Have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine if you can. And uh, see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.